Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for coming back to the podcast. My special guest today is Deidre McAteer, who is an adult Irish dancer in Vancouver who dances with the Andara uh, School of Irish Dancing. Deidre, good to have you on. Hi, hello, good evening. <laughs> you know, we follow each other a little bit on Instagram, and uh, as we do, we follow, you know, start following people's journeys and what are they doing with Irish dancing. And, you know, mm -hmm. everyone's got their own story, and that's what I like to, to, promote on, on my particular podcast is different unique journeys of Irish dancers, teachers and judges and performers. So I wanted to have you come on and talk about uh, life as an adult Irish dancer uh, in this day and age, because as we talked a little bit before the interview, it's changed a lot over the years. What it means to be yeah. an adult Irish dancer now is different than it was when I was competing 20 years ago. So let's, let's start your journey off. Let's go back in time a little bit and, and talk right. about your origins. Yeah, yeah. So we'll bring it back to I'm five years old. And um, my mom. And so my, my family is uh, Irish in heritage. And my mom wanted me to have more connection to that Irish heritage as a kid. So she saw there was a local school that offered Irish dance lessons. And she figured, hey, just bring her by for the free lesson, see how it goes. And I just was hooked from the be very beginning. Um, so that was with the Comerford School of Irish mm -hmm. Dance and Tony Comerford. Uh, they were up in the Portland area and Albany and kind of all throughout the mid Willamette Valley in Oregon. And I spent quite a few years with them and then, you know, got to compete a lot. I had so many medals and trophies um, <laughs> that was a little ridiculous. Actually, when I was preparing to leave for college, I'm like, what am I supposed to do with all of this? <laughs> um, but I I got to go to a rock disc, compete with a team, which was really great. Uh, unfortunately, then I broke my foot, uh, the fifth metatarsal in my right foot. And because of my uh my life I've just dealt with a lot of chronic pain um and I didn't really realize that my foot was broken I thought it just kind of hurt a little bit so I actually danced on it for almost a month before we went to the doctor and by that time it was a really bad break that hadn't healed correctly and I was put in a cast for almost two months and it was a really hard recovery and it just mentally changed something inside of me and I just wasn't able to recover from that. So then I quit, unfortunately. Uh, so that would have been when I was 11, almost 12. Um, and then I just, you know, pulled away from it because it was such a source of anxiety and frustration and then became a really major regret, but I didn't know how to fix it. And it wasn't actually until last year, uh, so 2022, that I was talking with my husband one day, and I don't even remember what I said, but I said something about Irish dance, because apparently I talk about it a lot. <laughs> and he just goes, I remember, he just looks at me, and he says, you know, babe, you talk a lot about Irish dance for somebody who doesn't actually do it. He's like, why don't you just see if there's a school in the area that, you know, offers classes? He's like, you don't need to compete. You don't need to, you know, perform. Just go do a couple classes, like remember the steps and everything. And so I got to searching and it turns out that my old school on DAR was still in the Portland area. Uh, and Jim and Lauren uh, Mueller are the, the teachers there. They're just the absolute best. And so I reached out to Lauren. I wasn't even sure if she would remember me because by that point it had been 17 years. So now I'm, I'm 28 and, you know, I had just turned 28 and, or sorry, I had just turned 27 actually and reached out. So I'm like, who knows if she'll remember. And she immediately calls me back and she is like, oh my God, Deirdre McAteer, you thought that I would forget that name. And so I just kind of knew I was like, okay, I need to come back. And so I did. And I just started doing lessons and did a performance at St. Patrick's Day and realized I still really love competing. Like I really want to get back out on that stage. So 
here I am. And it feels a little weird <laughs> to be doing it, but I absolutely love it. As crazy as this uh, niche sport is, I don't think any of us really ever leave it behind. That's true. I, I would completely agree with you, there, with you there. And, you know, there's something to be said about trying to reconnect with with the school that maybe you were with before and not everyone does that sometimes when they mm -hmm. come back either that school shut down or it split or they just want to go somewhere else you know maybe they didn't have a great experience yeah. but it's always good to know that you can you know you can go back to where you came from so it really it's good that it worked out for you in that way Oh, yes, it, it definitely felt like a homecoming. And in fact, one of the kids that I danced with, uh, well, I guess he's not a kid anymore. One of the adults who I danced with as a kid is uh, a like, he's not a certified instructor, but you know, he, he helps out with leading warm ups and stuff like that, uh, Derek. And so I saw him and I was just like, Oh, my gosh, like, I can't believe you're here. Yeah, this is crazy. And uh, as soon as I saw J Lauren, I swear she hasn't aged a day. I she, she's just still absolutely stunning with her beautiful red hair. And I was just like, Oh, my gosh, just how I remember. And yeah, she's just been so sweet and so supportive. Um, it's, it's been fantastic. And we have such a strong community of adults too, in mm -hmm. our school, and they just make class such an absolute joy. Well, I was going to ask you about that, because I remember Jim and Lauren from years ago, they come down to the Houston Fest when I used to compete with uh, my <laughs> teachers who were part of commission. And I remember they came down one time when they were with the Comerford School. And they were adults and they were in the championship level and really great dancers. And all the years later, I, you know, kind of see the name here and there. And I know they went up through the system and got certified and all that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. So that's great for them. So it's good that you have teachers that have that adult competition experience background themselves. Oh, absolutely. It's something that they, they talk about a lot and how different it used to be back mm -hmm. then versus the mm -hmm. changes that are, are coming in now. Um, which it's interesting to get that perspective. But I, I think too, like you mentioned, because they did compete as adults, they understand that, you know, it's it's not something that you just necessarily want to stop doing or, you know, need to stop doing just because you are, you know, aging out of kind of what we think of typical uh, com competitors. Mm -hmm. And I, I think too, especially in the Western region, you know, this year at our Aractus, we had 42 competitors in our adults under 40. And then I don't remember the exact number, but I believe it was around the same number in the adults over 40 category as well. And That's just good. really, really solid showing. Uh, and even at uh, nationals, we had, what, 135? compete I think and last year I didn't go last year but I was told last year it was only around like 80 something so it's definitely I, I think catching on and mm -hmm. as people are realizing wow I can come back and still compete like yeah. yeah let's get on it so I've talked to a lot of people actually who you know just in the last year they've been coming back too mm -hmm. so you talked about going through some of those physical challenges uh, things that would yeah. come up here and there. Talk about, you know, I know you mentioned your foot, but any other thing that may have come up that may have made things difficult, that, that road back a little bit of a challenge? Yeah, so it's not anything that um, myself or my parents realized when I was a kid, but um, when I was 19, I finally got diagnosed with something called lumbarization, which is a relatively rare birth defect in your lower back. And um, without getting too much into right. the anatomy, basically, it's like I have an extra vertebrae. And so I'm very hypermobile in my back. And it caused me so much pain when I was a kid growing up. And my pelvis ended up getting tilted up and forward. Okay. So I actually have arthritis in my right hip. Um, which is acting up a little bit today as we had a little bit of rain earlier. Um, but, you know, 
is what it is. Uh, I always tell people, hey, I can predict the weather at least. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I that was that was the, the beginning of it. And then I was like, okay, well, that addressed some of the pain issues, but there's still a lot of weird stuff going on. And it wasn't until many years later that I got the, I'd say, most um, impactful just to my general day-to-day -day life uh, diagnosis, which is my POTS diagnosis. It's otherwise known as a postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. It's something that affects a shocking amount of people, actually, um, especially women. I will say if you are listening to this and you ever feel like really lightheaded when you are standing up, um, that's that's not normal. Definitely get that checked out. That's That was my first warning sign. And then it just got worse from there. Um, basically, I just get a really elevated heart rate when I change positions and my blood pressure will drop. It leads to fainting episodes, which I have had some of. Thankfully, that doesn't affect my dancing too much because we stay upright, which is fantastic. Uh, conditioning can be a different story. You know, like I really like to do squats and, you know, weightlifting and stuff like that, but that is a very dangerous thing for me to do with that condition because I can, as your heart rate already gets elevated and then you, you know, go to sit up and then it goes even higher and your body's like, oh, we're going to black out for a second because we're getting, you know, into the danger zone. Obviously, if you have a weight in your hand, you don't want to be doing that. So I've had to change my, my just physical uh, workout routine outside of dance, which is something that I do feel has impacted some of my abilities, um, but it's something that I'm working around. And then, as is common, unfortunately, with POTS, uh, there's a lot of comorbid issues that you can have. So the one that really affects my dancing the most is my hypermobility. Um, the one thing that I used to show people just to demonstrate, I can do that, which is, I would guess most people think not normal. <laughs> um, uh, that's just one example of the hypermobility that I have. And it it's weirdly beneficial in some ways because like it helps with my turnout from my hips, you know, because I have really flex good flexibility in my hips. But then my ankles, on the other hand, are very uh, prone to getting sprained and rolled and injured along with my toes as well. So it's something that I have to be very careful of and is for me also difficult because I love toe work. And mm -hmm. it's something that I, you know, if I do too much of my toes will start kind of collapsing on me. And then if my ankle goes, you know, now I could be out for a few weeks not dancing. And obviously nobody wants that. Right. So <clears throat> again, something that I just have to incorporate into adjusting in my life and realizing the limitations of what I can and cannot do. And as long as I can still dance, I feel like that is the most important thing. You know, yeah. I want to be able to keep dancing as long as possible and not torture myself for a couple years and then end up sitting back and being like, well, dang, mm -hmm. why didn't I do that again? <laughs> so on that hypermobility, it, it almost seems like Maybe the ligaments and the tendons are too long or is it they're just too flexible? Maybe the fibers aren't as dense. They're, so if it's what I suspect, it, it would be uh, fall under something called Ehlers-Donlos syndrome. So that also known as EDS. And that specifically is a issue that affects the collagen in your mm -hmm. body. So collagen kind of acts as like the glue that holds everything together. Right. So there's just not enough of it. So everything is just really loose. Um, something that happens, for example, when I'm sleeping, I'm a side sleeper. My shoulder will start to, it's called subluxate, where it will start to partially dislocate when I'm sleeping because my muscles are keeping my joints in place, mm. not the actual joints themselves. Okay. So as I'm sleeping and I relax, gravity starts pulling it down. 
And then I wake up and you'll literally see me sometimes with my shoulder kind of hanging a little bit because it's partially dislocated. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's a very odd thing to realize that your joints just kind of are like, oh, we're just going to go wherever we want. <laughs> well, mine of their own. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> yeah. So uh, those are obviously some not obviously not insurmountable challenges. You're, you're, you're surmounting them the best you can, but, uh, I try. <laughs> it's something to consider. Well, besides that, what, what did you find the most difficult part of starting again after not have dancing for 17 years, as far as just the, the Irish dancing and the stylistic changes that we've all seen? Yeah. So, um, there's a lot of muscle memory that I didn't realize I had because, you know, hadn't used it for basically 17 years, but like the whips, for example, when I was a kid, it was all about getting it like as high up as possible. And like, if your knee came out in the process, like that's fine. Cause you just want to get it up there. But now the style is a nice, sharp, like, you know, cut, like really close to your body. And right. so things like that just trying to retrain the muscle memory is really really hard and I notice when I'm tired it will start kicking in and that old style will come out so I'd say really that was honestly probably the hardest thing for me was just trying to kick all of that out and be like nope this is what we got to do now um also, there's a lot more jumps involved than when I was a kid uh, and a lot of like, uh, you know, like the, the um, what are they called? Like the straddle jumps, like the, the mm. V jumps and stuff like that, mm. uh, which don't get me wrong. They're very fun to do, but it's a very different technique trying to trying to learn how to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but and I, I like a good challenge. So, you know, it's, it's been fun. <laughs> okay. And your first competition back, wh where was it at? And what was your experience walking back on the stage again after so many years? Oh, it was, it was really fun. So it was the Emerald City Fesh uh, hosted by the Tara Academy up in Seattle, Washington. Um, huge shout out to that Fesh. It's a amazing one. It was actually the very first one I ever competed in when I was a kid, uh, oh. which I thought was really funny that it was my first one back felt very right um and I I went up there and I was the only one that I knew from my school uh and I just I found some of the adults and I was like oh like is this where the adults are and they're like oh yeah and like who are you and I introduced myself and I'm like this is my first competition back and then they were all from the TAR Academy and they're all like oh my god like come here and they basically just like adopted me into their group they were so supportive and sweet um and getting up on stage for the first time I I, I there were no nerves it was so weird I was expecting to feel like really nervous and you know like oh my gosh like what am I doing why am I here uh but I I step up on stage and I just this like overwhelming happiness just washed over me. And I was like, oh my gosh, I forgot how much I love this. Mm -hmm. And as crazy stressful as competing is, I think anybody who has competed will tell you there's just something so addicting about it. Right. And it's it's such an amazing experience. Um, mm -hmm. As we talk, I'm in the, you know, post Arachtus glow still. And it was my first day back in the real world. And I'm like, oh, why? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it was it was fantastic. <laughs> yeah, well, we're going to flesh that out here in just a minute. But I wanted to back up to something you said earlier. And it's its, its own subject that I've been hoping to flesh out in one of these podcasts. And you, you presented the opportunity. So we're going to do that right now. Oh, nice. <laughs> um, you know, you, you gave your, your husband a lot of credit for kind of reintroducing you back into Irish dancing. Yeah. And, you know, I'm assuming he wasn't a dancer himself. So he no. picked up on you, your interest in it. And, you know, I'm sure you can relate to this, but so many, so many times when you, you get in relationships, uh, whether you're in dancing or out, but let's just say for someone who has an interest in it and they're doing it and e easily, you, you know, a partner may not be all that supportive of it and they can actually kind of steer you away from it, your, your passions and your interests. Yeah. And a lot of times people, whether it's reluctantly or, or happily go along because they don't want to disappoint the partner, you know, it's like, yeah. well, okay, we're together now and we're going to do this thing. But then in the back of your mind, it's like, you know, I kind of left this thing and 
you know, you want to come back. So talk about the importance of having a partner that's very supportive of what you do and not trying to get in your way and dissuade you from doing it. Yeah, he has uh, just been such an incredible support for me, um, especially being somebody that is technically considered disabled by the U.S. government with my my POTS and everything. Um, it has been a very emotional journey, um, you know, because there are some days I wake up and my body just is fighting against me and you know he's there to you know hug me and tell me you know hey it's okay you know like you'll be able to get back at it tomorrow um he also is uh, a musician and he's just gotten so into it and he's <laughs> made uh, actually a couple like metal versions of Irish oh, dance songs, cool. <laughs> um, which he has on SoundCloud by the way um what did you say uh, uh, he has them on SoundCloud. That's oh. uh, Bucket Drop Productions is his name. Okay. Um, they're they're pretty cool. I'm hoping to eventually make some little like choreography videos to post with them. Okay. Um, but yeah, he's just like he's so into it. And anytime I was stressing about like, oh my gosh, like I'm spending so much money. Why like why am I doing this? Because let's be real, competitions are a bit expensive, mm -hmm. especially once you add in the hotels. Right. <laughs> and you're like, oh. The dresses and you. <laughs> um, and yeah, anytime that I have any self doubt, he's there to tell me, you know, like, just remember how happy you are and why you're doing this again. Um, and I definitely do credit him for a lot of the uh, continuation, especially early on when I was starting up again and was still kind of questioning, like, is this a good decision? Am I wasting my time and my money doing this? Um, to which I will resoundly say, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> so Deidre, talk for a second to maybe someone who would be in this situation, male or female, because it, happened, it can happen on both sides, mm -hmm. uh, that maybe you know, they are in a relationship with someone and they're really into their dancing. And it's like, maybe the person's trying to talk them out of doing what they like to do. And, yeah. um, you know, talk to that person. So I would say if you are in that situation that you need to remember as important as that person might be in your life, ultimately your life is supposed to be lived for you, not for somebody else. And it is, important to follow the things that are going to make your soul happiest because we don't know how much time we're going to have on this earth and you know I think that we really should try to make the most of every single day that we have because whether it's your health or you know your mental health or any other number of things those might go at any given time nothing is guaranteed so just take what you can right now and as hard as it might be, even if that means leaving that person, if you know that pursuing your dance is going to make you happiest in the end, that's the most important thing. And surround yourself with people who make you feel happy about your dancing and who support everything that you want to do, because this is such an incredible gift that we are all given. And I don't want anybody to feel like they should give it away. Um, cause I, I feel like I let myself down when I quit and it was a huge regret for almost 17 years of my life. Um, and I can tell you that it has been the most cathartic experience to come back and prove to myself that, you know, all of those inner demons that I was fighting, that they were all made up. They didn't need to be dogging me all of those years. Mm -hmm. uh, so just do what makes you happiest. Right. And there are a lot of people who maybe they had an injury. You said you had an injury when you were mm -hmm. early in your dancing career. Yeah, I was um, yeah. 10, I believe, when 10, it happened. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, no one expects to be injured like that at 10 years old, but it does happen more than people think. And sometimes that injury can sideline a person and, and maybe they've healed and they've moved on past it. And they just think, oh, but I don't know. I'll, I'm never going to be the dancer I was before. Mm -hmm. I had a former dancer 
that was her story. She had, I think she had broken that same bone, that fifth metatarsal. Mm. And that's the one that'll really put a fear into you because, you know, you're using your feet all the time. Uh, and she had told me years later that, you know, the reason she'd come back from a short amount of time, but then she, she left again and I never knew why. And she messaged me later on and said, well, it was because I, I knew I could not be the dancer I was before and the dancer I wanted to be. And I thought, but you're missing out on the big picture, you know, like you could, I mean, everyone's got their path, but like you, you could still come back in and do some things with it. Mm -hmm. There's many dimensions to dancing besides competition and performing. You could maybe, oh. maybe you're just the motivational coach in there. You're just getting in shape or teaching or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So speak to that person who may be, who may want to come back, but that, like you said, all those little demons and you might thump them off your shoulder, but they keep coming. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, ultimately, I, when I came back, I didn't even think I was going to compete. I just, you know, wanted to get back into dancing for myself. And, you know, I know that eventually I want to become a, a TCRG because I do want to, you know, continue my passion for this, uh, this amazing uh, sport on to the next generation. Um, and it doesn't, as I have learned, it doesn't matter what you may have been able to do in the past, uh, you will always be able to do something in some capacity. Um, I can't tell you how many people have, you know, left comments for me or messaged me over the about nine-ish months I've been on my Instagram saying that, you know, just me posting about how upfront I am with my physical disabilities um, and setbacks, how that has been really inspiring to them and, you know, helping them realize like, oh, like I can still do this too. There are so many ways that you can help people, um, especially it, with like the younger kids, you know, I'm sure if anybody did this when they were younger, they know how you can get in your head about mm -hmm. things and how, uh, you know, difficult that can be. And just having a really positive, you know, light in these kids' lives will make such a huge difference. So yeah, there's there's totally so many ways that you can come back and, and help. Um, even if it's just, you know, being there to support from the sidelines and, right. you know, be like a fesh mom or a fesh dad, right? Like we, we all need them. Uh, otherwise we'd go crazy without them. No, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had a young lady start back. She was a little bit younger than you start back tonight and she hadn't danced in 10 years. And mm -hmm. ironically her first, well, her teacher and my first teacher were the same person uh, oh, that no teacher way. since retired, but uh, it was, it was neat kind of having some, I didn't know her, you know, she had started way after I'd retired, but um, having a person come back in, that was kind of a connection to that part of your past. Totally. And seeing a little bit, you know, just kind of reintroducing her to some dancing and, you know, seeing a little bit of that style. And of course she relates to me because I have very much a lot of my own, te my teacher's style, plus some other influences, but mainly their style. Mm -hmm. um, so that I, th I always find that, that really interesting. Now, you know, I think you were my 167th or eighth interview. And when I interviewed the, the, uh, more sage professionals in our, our endeavor judges, oh, uh, yes. stuff like that, you know, usually what, what they will say is there's a little bit too much of an emphasis on competition at the expense of every other aspect of Irish dancing culture. And I put the, I always yeah. put those two things together in my school. It's not just Irish dancing, it's Irish mm -hmm. dancing culture, like music. What are your thoughts on that being a younger dancer and someone who's just getting back into the competition and all those opportunities? Do you think there's too much of an emphasis on competition at the expense of a broader cultural picture or is it just right for you? Um, I mean, I can definitely see where, where they're coming from. I do think that there are some mm -hmm. schools and, and just some people in general that are more focused on the competitive side of things. Um, which is, you know, that's totally fine and valid. Uh, but I think it is important to remember where we are getting this, these dances from. And, um, you know, for me, especially, like I said, I am, let me double check my math here. 
fourth generation um, Irish on okay. my dad's side. And so my when my relatives, when my ancestors came over here, they came over here because of the potato famine. Um, and as my husband knows, that's a topic that will really get me heated. So I won't say too much about <laughs> <Sorry>. it. <laughs> um, but like the fact that we keep our arms at our side and, you know, I, I always ask younger dancers, I'm like, do you know why we do this? Mm -hmm. And this is one of the things that I love about Jim and Lauren, by the way, they always make sure to say this, you know, mm -hmm. the reason why we do this is because when you were dancing in the pubs during the British occupation, you know, they were, they were trying to eradicate Irish culture, let's right. not sugarcoat it. Mm -hmm. And so they couldn't be seen dancing, but we're Irish, we don't care what the British are going to tell us. <laughs> so we're going to dance anyway, but we're going to keep our arms at our side and we're going to just pretend like we're just walking walking around and what are you going to stop us from walking in the pub now <laughs> so you know there's definitely that cultural aspect is very important so I, I think it is I think it is good to make sure that it doesn't necessarily have to be a like the, the point of emphasis mm -hmm. in your teaching but I think that it should be something that is at least acknowledged uh, and I know for myself personally I adore Irish culture, so I, you know, definitely embrace that side of things, but I don't feel like it is represented as much at the competitions. Mm -hmm. So I, I would love to see maybe a little bit more of a crossover, like, it would be really cool if they could have, uh, like, Irish music, like, competitions, like, with right. the dance competitions as well, for example, mm -hmm. you know, something like that, or I've seen... Some of the local uh, Fashana do this, uh, the like, you know, soda bread competitions mm -hmm. or stuff like that. Uh, so, you know, I, I think there's definitely ways that we can incorporate the two. Right. One thing I, I took uh, on Kogal's, all their great exams, and I'm probably going to go back and take their teacher's exam in time. And one thing I really like about them is when you take their great exams, you, you don't just go in there and you do your dancing. You do, mm -hmm. well, one, you do a ton of dancing. I've taken the CLRG grades as well, and there's a lot more that's in the Kogal grades. Oh, really? You have, <laughs> to know, you have to know the names of all the dances in Gaelic. You've got to mm -hmm. know basic introductions, greetings, and stuff like that. And, of course, it was a little bit of a shock, me taking them as, you know, I'm quite a bit older than you are, but I liked it. I didn't, I didn't yeah. care for it at first. I thought, man, all these extra steps. But then... I thought, okay, well, I've always preached that this is so much more than just the dancing. Uh, there's more that goes into this. And that really actually complemented my thought process. So I'm actually glad they made me do all that. Now all of my dancers know all the names of the dances in Irish. And they're learning more about why these set dances are called this and that. And where did that tradition come from? So I, I really like that. Yeah, I, I do too. Is, I really, really cool. appreciate that a lot. Um, it, was, it was It was a lot more difficult, but... Oh, absolutely. I, I'm I'm learning Irish myself, and I'll be the first to say it's not an easy language. <laughs> no, it's not easy. Uh, and, and you look at it, and it's like the word's this long, but it's pronounced something like that. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but I, I love the language. And, and I, I'm certainly not a Gwelger. I mean, I can't, we can't carry on a conversation, but I could certainly tell you, oh, no. you know, core is real, port is jig, you know, all that kind of, I can tell you all of that. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I can string together a few basic sentences. Sure point <laughs> yeah absolutely so you talked about that there was a good strong uh, adult program in andara so so talk yes. about that yeah. you, you know in your level i think you told me before the interview you're in the the champion adult championship competitions are yes. there a lot of dancers at that level in there or is it more um more beginners and maybe intermediates or, or how's it we we have we have a pretty good mix so we have um well at Aractus this year alone we had besides myself we had four five other um champ dancers uh adult champ dancers and then we also have some adults who only do like the set dance competitions mm -hmm. um you know where they'll just do one of the traditional sets which I love that they have that as its own category, you know, make sure that we're keeping that tradition alive. Um, and then we have like our teams as well. Um, in fact, our team just got first place, um, awesome. at the, you know, our, our mixed forehand. Yeah. So I'm so proud of them. They did great. 
Yeah. Um, so yeah, we have we have a, a really strong representation. And then we also have adults who don't compete at all, you know, who just do it for fun, whether it's for exercise or they danced when they were younger and you know they like to do performance stuff um as so yeah it's really great because our our teachers they encourage whatever you want to do it's it the fact that you are there dancing is good enough for them and then if you want to do anything extra they'll push you all you want but okay. you know it's yeah up to you so it's okay. it's really great um and we have some other adults who do compete but are at like the lower levels and like the the prelims uh, mm. levels and stuff like that okay. and then we have a few who are in the the seniors in the the andovers okay so, all right yeah we, we we have quite quite a good showing all across the board that sounds like it, it sounds like you've got a good strong group and, it, and it's always nice to walk into a class and see see people you can relate to not that there's anything wrong with dancing against kids dancing with kids we've all done that but uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> it, it's nice to look at someone and, and see that they have a little more life experience that you can relate to. Yeah. Or, you know, you can like have that post-class discussion yeah. and be like, oh my gosh, you need to go get a beer right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That that so, definitely happened a, a time yeah. or two when they just like really put it through it and put us through yeah. it. We're just, oh man. <laughs> you have to get a little reward after class. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> So talking to the that, that is like one of the nice things I will say about being an adult dancer. Um, yeah. After the uh, the my first fesh actually back up in Seattle, uh, the adults uh, they had a get together planned at one of the local Irish taverns. Mm. So we we went over there and we were just hanging out and they let us play music and so we're just even though we just got done dancing and competing all day we're out there up dancing again <laughs> of course you know a few drinks in us so it wasn't our best dancing but yeah yeah <laughs> so talking to those dancers like you mentioned a, a minute ago that have come back that maybe they danced before like you did mm -hmm. what seems to be is there what seems to be the reason they come back is there a recurring theme or is it just a plethora of different reasons they come uh, back i'd say a lot of it, so it, it seems to be either two things. It seems to be either um, one, they now have a child that they are enrolled in um, to dance classes and they're like, hey, I should start dancing again too, which I think is just fantastic because oh, they awesome. can dance together and that sounds amazing. Um, or I'd say the other common one is they're more like me. They dance as a kid and they just realized they really missed it. Um, for one reason or another, they stopped, um, you know, whether it's injury or, you know, like they left for college or you know, moved or whatever. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, it's definitely, I'd say mostly people who are coming back. We do though have some people who are just like totally brand new, um, to dancing as well, which, which is really cool. And what do you, for those who have never done it before and they're new to this, what do you find is, is their reason for starting this? I know in my own school where I teach, I mean, everyone's got different reasons for coming, whether it's fitness or mm -hmm. they didn't fit in with any of the dance forms and that this is unique and they wanted something unique. What, what's some of the feedback that you've, you've heard? Yeah, so I, I know one of our dancers who started, she actually saw us at uh, one of our St. Patrick's Day performances. And she just thought that it looked like so much fun. Um, and so she, you know, came up and, you know, had her little free class and she was like, wow, yeah, this is really fun. And so that, that was fantastic. Um, you know, just uh, spreading the, the joy just by doing what we do. Um, and I know there was another gal who um, started, she kind of something you had mentioned, she wanted to exercise, but she didn't really like going to a gym and she didn't feel like she, you know, was comfortable doing other types of dances. Um, so she, I think she said like a friend had recommended um, Irish dance to her. Mm -hmm. So she checked us out and yeah, still coming. So we must be doing something, right? <laughs> yeah. So you'd mentioned the Oroctus was this last weekend, the Western, that was the Western region Oroctus, yes. right? Yeah, the Western regional Oroctus down in Phoenix, down in Phoenix yeah. Arizona. Okay. And so uh, had you, had you done an Oroctus when you were a kid or no? I did. I had done, uh, my memory is honestly a little bit fuzzy, um, but I believe just the one. 
Um, and I say <laughs> my memory's fuzzy because turns out I had a raging kidney infection mm. uh, at the time that I did not realize. Um, yeah, so I don't really remember much of it. I know that there was a team dance that I did. I know I did solos. I think I placed, but I don't remember. <laughs> it was all very much a blur. Um, so I had done one before, but it still felt very much like a new experience, especially being an adult. You have such a different perspective on competitions in general. Mm -hmm. Um I it wasn't my first major back though. I did go to nationals, um, the okay. North American nationals um earlier this year, back in July. So that was my first major competition. And I had actually never gotten to go to nationals as a kid. Um, so that was a a very emotional experience for me. Um this time around though, I was just like going to have fun. And it was, it was great. It was a wonderful weekend. Uh, okay. Fantastic dancing, fantastic friends. <laughs> okay. We talked earlier in the interview about the, uh, certainly something your teachers could relate to and, and me as well, because, you know, when I first started, I didn't know anything about the Andovers and, you know, there was an adult <laughs> competition category, but you were limited to what you could do. And yeah. so you could, you could easily, if you had any ability whatsoever and you had a you know good work ethic, you could progress pretty quick through that. And then you kind of just peaked out and then you had to drop into the Andovers and dance with whatever the highest age group was. So you could find yourself in your twenties and up dancing against a 15 year old or a 16 year old. And it, you know, makes you work hard because they have that natural ability. But at the same time, you kind of want someone that's a little more in your age range. Talk yeah. about the opportunities that are afforded now. And of course, you're a commission dancer. So in the commission world, uh, mm -hmm. that weren't available in the past. Yeah. So they have they have so many age categories now um, because there are just so many uh, dancers who are continuing to dance throughout their um, late teenage and early 20 years. So the oldest one, if you're not an adult champ dancer, the oldest one would be the 22 and over category. So and they determine age, if I remember correctly, they determine age by your age at the beginning, uh, January 1st. Mm -hmm. um, so whatever age you are then. So there's a 22 and over and then um, 22 and under. And then I believe it goes 20 under, uh, 18 and under. And then from there, it goes every year down. Okay. So um there's like a very tight brackets but there's still huge competitions which is crazy like i know one of the i think it was the under 15s they had over 30 something uh place just place mm -hmm. um so yeah there's a lot of a lot of uh dancers who are continuing now into the the older brackets um the the 22 and over category is fiercely competitive <laughs> Hmm. I don't know if I would ever drop down into it. People have asked me before and I'm like, I think I'm good as an adult dancer. <laughs> Those right. ladies are a bit scary. <laughs> yeah. And, and so the Oroctus, what was that experience like? Is it just this weekend? Mm -hmm. Oh, it was, it was really fun. So um, there was a, um, on our day, there was the adults dancing. Um, and then we also had all of the team dancing as well. Um, and because it was all the team dances, there was so, so many kids there. Uh, and so the energy was just like infectious. You could, you know, just feel, feel it in the air. Um, and it was, it was a lot of fun. It was, um, let's see, well, it dumped for a few hours, uh, in the beginning on Saturday. So it was a little muggy that, that will be my biggest complaint, uh, I was very sticky throughout the entire day, unfortunately. Um, but it, the all of the adults were just so supportive um, and just really fantastic community. Whether you are, you know, from their school or not, they're going to, you know, yell and cheer for you when you're done dancing and they're going to give you a hug. Um, I've met so many people that like we follow each other on Instagram and we're like, oh my gosh, like, you know, we finally see each other like in real life. And 
um, it's it's great to have that support from people who aren't even in your school, especially because some people who do come, they might be like the only adult dancer at their school. And so, you know, I've heard from several people that it's very encouraging when they go to a fesh and they are just, you know, welcomed by all of the other adults. I know when I was a kid, and I competed, um, I definitely felt like it was very much, uh, you know, you're, you're there for yourself. You're not there to really make friends type deal and mm -hmm. totally the opposite with the adult community. Yeah. That, that was the category I was in. I went, I had my friends, but when I was there, I was just, I, I did every competition I could when I competed and I was just mm -hmm. focused. It just as my routine, you know? Yeah. Was, yeah. And then when I was done, Hey, let's go get something to eat. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's there's definitely plenty of that too, exactly. for sure. I I'm definitely one of the people that I I get a little more into the zone. I'm not quite as sociable like on the day of. You know, like once I've had my if I recall, once I've had my recall round done, then I'm like, okay, now I can be your best friend. But until then, I'm like. Oh, like, yeah, I'll talk to you, but I want to get back to like right. practicing and going over my steps in my head. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I get it. I don't know if you know Cesar, Cesar Gutierrez. Yes, I do. Yeah. I got to meet him at nationals. Yeah. Uh, he is a fantastic uh, dancer and just such a sweet guy. <laughs> he is. I had him on the podcast and we talked quite a bit about his, his own experience. And I know I follow him and, you know, he went to the Great Britons and everything. Mm -hmm. And those, those opportunities for adults wouldn't have existed back when. I was competing. So I just, I think it's great if you want to uh, utilize those opportunities, you can. Absolutely. It's, it's amazing. Um, and I think this was the first year, if I remember correctly, that adults could go to Great Britain's, um, okay. which I think is just such, such a cool experience. Um, I want to go next year, hopefully, actually. Um, and I, I'm hoping my ultimate hope is that we can get a category at worlds. I kind of feel like it, it feels almost inevitable because mm -hmm. they, they keep adding more and more for adults, um, you know, as they realize like there's a lot of adults who are still out there and, and mm -hmm. wanting to, you know, engage in this community. Uh, we, really like torturing ourselves I guess. <laughs> so so speaking of torturing yours well to us it wouldn't be torture but some people might look at this all the stuff you guys do all those practices what is your uh your regimen how many classes are you going to are there private lessons you take and conditioning classes and everything yeah, like that so so I, I go to two um one and a half hour classes a week okay um on back-to-back uh, -back nights which is rough on my knees I will admit um but I have those classes and then outside of class I we're in my very tiny little dance studio area so I, I do um you know a lot of drill work uh and stretching and stuff back here and then um I also have a, a gym membership where I go and I use their nice big yoga studio right. to actually you know like do all my steps so I would say I literally do at least something dance related every single day mm -hmm. um most days though I would probably say I do anywhere from like a half hour to like almost up to an hour and a half depending on uh you know like if I'm preparing for a competition or you know if we have a performance coming up you need know, to work on steps or whatever um but I just there's so much of dancing that I just love doing just for the sake of doing it um like you know there are just making up rhythms with my rallies and you know and my hard shoes it's just so much fun um I always tell people you know how cool is it that you can make music with your feet oh, like yeah. who wouldn't want to do that yeah <laughs> so looking behind you over your left shoulder there's so there's some some trophies and some yes. uh sashes <laughs> there you know talk about some of those highlights that you got back there those those memories that those trophies represent yeah so this is actually all from um my adult dancing career okay um everything that I got as a kid 
quite literally everything burned up in a barn fire, unfortunately. So I only have pictures, <laughs> um, very few pictures uh, of all of those and the mental memories. Um, but yeah, so these are my, all of my uh, things from just the stuff I've done since then. And um, I, I will say getting to see this every single day, especially like I said, on those days when my body is not cooperating with me as much, um, especially in the summer because heat is a really big trigger for my um, my POTS issue. So I basically become a hermit in the summer, which is difficult because I used to be outside all the time in the summer. Um, so getting to, you know, see all of that stuff is just a, a nice reminder of like, you know, what I can do and, you know, why I am pushing myself through all of this stuff. Um, and I, I do want to point out one thing very okay. specifically. Um, so earlier this year, um, as you probably know, we lost a very, uh, very dear member of the Irish dance community, Robert Haley. And I had the absolute uh, pleasure and joy of competing in the Robert Haley Memorial Fesh. Uh, he was a huge um, influence in the uh, Irish dance community out here in the Pacific Northwest. So oh, I got awesome. third place um, in that adult solo competition, which <laughs> even now is making me choke up a little bit. Um, and uh, the... Um, Actually, the gal who won first place uh, is one of his dancers at the Haley Prendergast School. She made all of the trophies. Um, oh, so that's nice. See that. So yeah. yeah, we have these lovely, this lovely memorial for him. And he loves Star Wars. So also this fantastic little Star Wars ornament, mm. which I just adore. Um, yeah, and so that that was one of those moments where you realize how much bigger Irish dancing is than just the competitions, than just the fancy dress and the sash and the trophies. And mm -hmm. it was seeing every single person in that room brought to tears uh, when his memorial was uh, mentioned and mm -hmm. seeing the impact that this person who many of these people had never even met but knew of what he had done for our community right. um it's it's those moments that make you realize like how important and how special this is mm -hmm. so yeah that that's one specifically that always brings me just so much joy every time i look up and see it absolutely yeah we definitely ride on the shoulders of giants because if you take the time to learn anything about Irish dancing, but this isn't something that just came about, you know, mm -hmm. in 1994 when river dance came out, which is when, right, when right. many <laughs> of us discovered it. And then hopefully you take the time to research it a little bit and you realize it goes back hundreds of years and mm -hmm. there's people whose names you may have mentioned, but you don't really know much about them and their contributions. And if it hadn't been for them, many of our teachers would have never become teachers. And therefore we probably would have never gotten into this either. Yeah, yeah. There's um, there's a uh account on Instagram. I don't remember the handle, unfortunately, mm -hmm. but they um they've reposted like colorized versions of some of the really really old like dance masters um mm -hmm. who were videographed at you know like the uh, very early nineteen um you know twenties and thirties, um and yeah, it's definitely getting to remember where we come from. Mm -hmm. is uh just so huge and getting to trace down your legacy and you know like why why we have the stuff about you know mm -hmm. and why why do we have well not so much the style in current competition dresses right. I will say but when I was a kid you know you had the dress with the um the sash on the back right. you know why why do you have that well that's because that's where you'd place all of your medals that mm. you got you know from over the years and so the more noise you made the more people knew oh wow that's a really good person we've got to watch out for <laughs> that's true yeah. yeah so yeah it's and there are there are pieces of the past that are present in every single thing that we do there's no denying it absolutely true the more of these podcasts that I do, especially talking to people who've been in Irish dancing for, you know, most of their life. And, and maybe they were taught by teachers that go back 
80 to 100 years or so. Mm -hmm. The more I realize that though I've learned a lot about it over the years, there's there's so much I never knew, and and there's even more oh, that absolutely. I just took it for granted. Mm -hmm. You know why we do this and where did this come from? And there's there's such a the story. There's so many stories, and a lot of it doesn't come out. And it's I think the I, most people have a very incomplete picture of Irish dancing. We we know what I our teachers teach us. <laughs> we know what we see, but there's mm -hmm. so much more that connects it all together. Oh, absolutely. Um, and I mean, even what I think it's funny, you mentioned like what, what our teachers teach us um, at, at Aractus this past weekend. So uh, my traditional set, because adults, um, we dance traditional sets, if we okay. recall, we don't do non-trad sets, which I, I like and I don't like at the yeah. same time, because that's like, right. non-trad sets are fun, but mm -hmm. it's nice to keep everything, you know, alive. And so I do the Blackbird. It's my favorite trad set. Mm -hmm. But I have very specific choreography that comes from a very specific lineage. Then there was uh, a group of dancers that did the Molino Blackbird, mm -hmm. which is a completely different choreography. Like I, I only know it's Blackbird because of the music. Nothing about it is similar to me, right? But that comes from another lineage, and it, they're both, you know, correct, right? And so it's really interesting that there are like is in the set dances you might only be taught one particular type of set dance and then not realize until years later like oh there's another version of that what and so it's like i it's something that i i kind of wish they would teach you or at least like show you what all of the other different versions are because it's something that uh, i think is i don't know i don't want to say dying out but i worry maybe could potentially have you know certain forms that kind of get lost to the ages which would be a shame because mm -hmm. they've survived for so long right i i tell you what's interesting about the traditional set dance is that's something i've i've become more interested in over the years and talking to the historians that, that would know the truth i mean those people who gave us those dances we're not certified teachers. They were, mm -hmm. they were itinerant teachers. They were the traveling dance masters. In, in fact, yeah. some of them were kind of on the tail end of that tradition, like Jeremiah Malino, Jerry Mannix, some people call him Jerry Mannix. Uh, you know, he died in the late, I think it's the late 1960s. And the system was there. The first TCRG was Lillian O'Moore in 1947. So, I mean, the system was there, but the, some of these people just, they didn't go that way, but yet they taught so many people and sticking point for me, I mean, if you watch any of my podcasts, this will come up from time to time, but there's so much emphasis on that, those letters at the end of your name. And if you don't have that, you're kind of in some groups, you're not treated as an equal, but mm -hmm. yet you're mm -hmm. still teaching and you're, you're sharing the traditions and you're contributing in your own way. Like those dance masters did. They didn't know anything about that standardized system. They taught and they were recognized as, as professionals, as experienced dancers and teachers. And that was their certification, as it were. Um, so I think it's important to realize that, that you can learn something from, from pretty much anybody, not necessarily just people who've gone through the process and got those letters. So yeah, those people that contributed. Was, that was, they that gave cool. us Irish dancing without that system. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I, I like that. That was a good point to remember for sure. So what, what's next for Deidre? What, what are you working on next? Are you getting ready for a competition? Um, well, I don't know. Um, I think first and foremost, <laughs> a little bit of rest okay. <laughs> um, first, although I, I am anxious as weird as it sounds, I am anxious to get back into dance class, but have to wait until after Thanksgiving break. So okay. uh, I'm, I'm forced to rest. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, but no, I mean, I might do, I might do a local fesh, um, down in California, um, in January, cause a little bit of sun sounds nice. Like I said, I'm in Washington, so mm -hmm. you just have gray skies for months on the end up here. Um, but besides that, um, we have, uh, the grade exams now, um, oh, yeah. which is, that's a totally new concept mm -hmm. to me. We didn't okay. have those as a kid. So, I'm still like not a hundred percent certain on uh, everything that in, is involved with it. I'll be honest, but I've done like five of them, I think now. Okay. So we have great exams in February. So I, that's pretty much going to be the main thing I'm focusing on is that. And then 
uh, St. Patrick's Day, we always do a bunch of St. Patrick's Day performances and wearing one of my Kells shirts. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, nice. Right now. Yeah, they're they're one of our, our really big local uh, Irish pubs. And okay. so we'll, we'll do a bunch of um, performances for St. Patrick's Day. So okay well yeah, maybe you can get lauren and jim the teacher to the uh the molino version of st patrick's day and y'all can do that yes right i know well, well after after i saw the the blackbird i went and i looked up all like some of the other ones too and i was like wow these are like really really interesting i want to learn it just to like challenge myself because mm -hmm. there's a lot of choreography too that are just literally steps i've never actually tried to do right so, yeah right that'd be fun <laughs> yeah and you know the, even if you do the more, I'm going to call them more standardized, more contemporaneous versions of the, the traditional set dance, not Malino, um, you know, there are longer parts. I, in, in Kogal, we had to learn the entire part, not just what I would consider the fesh ver the short version. Like there's a <laughs> lot more to them. And I am so glad I learned those. I teach them to all my dancers. And so, you know, you're dancing out there for a while. And there's some pretty interesting steps if you learn the, like the second sets and the second step and the last step. It's it's pretty interesting to learn yeah. the whole thing. Yeah, that that would be a lot of fun. I definitely would like to to learn that. It's a marathon. <laughs> I it, it sounds like it. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I, yeah. So, some of the, the sets are long enough as is. <laughs> so... Right. Yeah, yeah. And you, and you know, one, one of our dancers does King of the Fairies, and mm -hmm. I'm always just like, oh, oh, I wish she's done dancing. I'm not even dancing it. But. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. That's a good one, too. I taught one of my dancers uh, that, and she really liked it a lot. And uh, we had a class fest recently, so she got to do that one. And oh, nice. yeah, it's a lot of fun seeing the dancers uh, do those dances. You know, when I learned them when I was younger, it's like, okay, it was kind of cursory. Uh, you got to learn it. But then I wanted mm -hmm. to learn the contemporary set dances. Yes. But yeah. then when, you, when I became a teacher, I just, I really glommed on to those traditional set dances because if you're good at those, you're going to be good at everything else in hardship because the fundamentals are there. And if you can't do the timing right and the execution right there, you really have no business doing the other ones because it, it all, they all kind of complement each other. That, that, that is so true. That is so true. In fact, one of the ways that I really like how Jim and Lauren teach it is they, they'll specifically tell you like, this is what we're working on, like in this set, like, you know, this is kind of the point of emphasis, right? So like in uh, St. Patrick's Day, for example, that's the very first time you introduce a rock. And mm -hmm. so that's when you're starting to get used to the concept of a rock um, and like the, you know, tip downs and stuff like that. And then in Blackbird, now you are playing around with your drums. And so you're learning how to do drums for the first time. And then like you start, you know, putting them together as you, you know, get up. And then like you, you're learning your boxes in, um, what is it? Garden of Daisies, I think. Um, stuff like that. Yeah. So I, I like how they, they show like the fundamentals that you are learning and why yeah. they're important to learn. Absolutely. And, and so in conclusion, uh, Deidre, talk about any, I guess maybe people who've helped you along the way, this journey. I know you've, you recently back on this journey, but uh, I know you've given your, your husband a lot of credit, but there's a, maybe it's him or maybe it's someone else that's maybe kind of encouraged you and uh, kept you going along this and, and encouraging you to continue this on into the future. Oh, um, well, I mean, besides the, the uh -huh. obvious of my, you know, my dance teachers, Jim and Lauren, right. my, my dance mom and dad, as it were, um, my, my parents, I mean, they were the ones who started this journey all those many years ago when they, they signed me up for classes. Um, and in fact, my mom got to come to a rock disc with me, which was just such a great experience. Um, and you know just having the support of them um and knowing that they basically <laughs> i felt like i disappointed them when i quit dancing and knowing that they don't feel anything like that and you know that they're just there to support me uh no matter what i do is just so great um so yeah, I I really couldn't do it without the the people in my life supporting me. This is it's a well, unless you do teams dances, it's a solo competition, but it's not a solo sport. Mm -hmm. Hmm. 
so yeah i i definitely have to give a huge shout out to to all of them um and then you know my my teammates as well um at dance class commiserating with me <laughs> they really put us through the ringer sometimes but you know it it pays off i guess so <laughs> okay well very good well deidre i'm glad you got to to come on and tell us about your experiences and I wish you and the dancers in the school all the best. And hey, get that TCRG and share what you've learned with the next generation one day. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. I It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, and I definitely will look forward to talking with you in the future and, you know, keeping you updated on this crazy little life I got going on. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I love watching everybody's story and you've, you've got a good story going on there. And pro well, again, you. props to your husband for supporting what you do because so many people are taken away from it. Like we mentioned earlier, it's, it's good when you got someone is, you know, you're together, but like they're, they're, they're pushing you as well. They want to see you succeed mm -hmm. and like, you want to see him succeed in his music and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. 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 He's, yeah. He's an absolute, absolute best man uh, in the world. So. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks again, Deidre. Thank you. You have a fantastic night. <laughs> Hello. If you appreciate these interviews and my attempts to document Irish dance history, please consider making a small donation to support my efforts through my Venmo. Thank you for your support and keep dancing.